College should be a time of excitement, exploration, a time to redefine who you are. For some students, they may be the first in their family to attend college, trying to not only better their own lives, but the lives of their families too. Literally everybody in my family was unemployed. But for others, attending college may be an even bigger deal and an even bigger challenge. I had enough money to stay in hotels for the beginning of my homelessness. After the money ran out, I then went to the result to the shelter because I knew that I wanted to keep my kids safe. Thanks to brave students sharing their stories and the dedicated educators willing to listen, we've learned that students are coming to class hungry, struggling to finish homework, navigate extracurricular activities, hold down jobs, and feed themselves. Eventually you start losing focus and your body starts shaking. Their grades suffer and many are forced to drop out at a much higher rate than their food secure peers. I was feeling like enough was enough and I couldn't take it with being homeless with two children. But that doesn't have to be the only way. Hi, thank you for calling Purple Apron Pantry. Colleges and Food Bank for New York City have teamed up to establish over 20 college campus pantries across the city to help stamp out hunger one student at a time. You can always come to school and find the resources you need. I now know that I can take, I cannot take them for granted because the, all of the great resources they provide for us is not everywhere else. When you bring fresh, nutritious food to campuses, you change lives, delivering the vital resources students need to survive and the hope they need to thrive. It's a blessing. It's it's like it's like thank you to God. Like like in um in our language we say Alhamdulillah, which is thanking God for whatever He's giving us. Let's empower our city's future leaders to achieve food security for good. There is no one better to invest in them than you. Welcome to the College Food Security Summit. My name is Kamisha Gran. I am the Vice President for Community Impact and Investment here at the Food Bank for New York City. Thank you so much for being here today. We're excited that you have been able to join us for this first convening of its kind, a collaboration between Food Bank New York City and Medgar Evers College to raise awareness on this very important issue of food security on college campuses. So why are we here? As you heard on the video, college students are our future. And I think we can all agree to that, yes? So there is an issue that is impacting far too many of our college students, and that is hunger on college campuses. We brought in the biggest and the brightest names in this space to share insights with us today, information, personal stories, and data. We'll hear from advocates and leaders in academia who will not only address the problem, but actually talk to us about solutions. And now I'd like to welcome to this stage, Dr. Jesse Kane, Senior Vice President of Student Success and Enrollment Management at Mega Evers College. It is my pleasure to greet you this morning and to welcome you to Mega Evers College as we really are um, discussing very important and critical issue um, for our students, but also for our community and city. Um, this issue is one that we see as um, part of our student success strategy here at the college and that understanding that access to healthy foods um, without um, having to worry where your next meal comes from is an important part of our learning here at the college. And so we are so fortunate to have partners like New York City Food Bank to help us do this work. Um, and so I am happy to be able to work with Dr. Walik Boone through what he does through the Transition Academy and providing these wraparound services to our students. And so what he has done and what he is doing, not only for the students at Mega Evers, but for the Mega Evers community at large, is nothing short of amazing. So uh, welcome. Um, I'm happy to learn from you all. I'm ha happy to be engaged in an action-based conversation because it's important to talk about it, but it's also important to have strategies where we can um, develop um, approaches to address this issue so that we don't have to have um, conferences like this and summits like this, right? That we can eradicate this issue. So that was my first task. My second task is to introduce to you our president, um, Dr. Patricia Ramsey. On May, in May of 2021, Dr. Ramsey joined Mecca Evers College as our 
sixth president and our first woman president. She is a scientist, and so she's very, um, the way that she thinks about problems is through a scientific approach, right? And so this is similar to this. This issue is similar to how she approaches most issues, really investigating what the challenge is and to develop the appropriate solutions to address those challenges. And she has done that in her time here at Mega Evers as she's leading this campus to a new directions and supporting the work that is being done on this important issue. Um, it is my pleasure to bring um, before you our sixth president, Dr. Patricia Ramsey. Welcome to Mega Evers College, a college birthed out of this very community, out of the central Brooklyn community. We are here today to talk about food security. But food security is connected to, the, to a lot of other things as we know, because if we have healthy food, it helps us to have healthy communities. And so education is key to us being successful as a community and as a country. As a college president, how will you ensure that the Transition Academy continues to be a lifeline for, in, for the individuals of the college and for the community? Well, um, one of the things that I, I believe in is um, educating the whole student and Transition Academy is such a big part of that. Um, and so we just have to make sure that they have the resources that they need to continue the work. And so we've been trying to do what we can to be as supportive as we can in that regard. What surprises has the Transition Academy um, done? Have, have you witnessed with the um, community and with the students? Well, um, the thing that I, I, I love about uh, the Transition Academy, I mean, they're always, uh, or Dr. Boone and his leadership, reinventing themselves, if you will. And so um, it was just amazing to see that in addition to what we had with the pantry, that they were able to bring in food, the trucks with fresh fruits and vegetables, not just for our students, but for the community. Uh, what do you hope for the attendees to take away from, from this summit? Well, it is my hope that attendees will think about the conference, those people who are, in, who are in that room, what I said at the end, and that is put yourself in the shoes of your neighbor, uh, in our case, our students, and treat that person the way you would wish to be treated. And so people need to think more about others than about themselves. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's so great that you can be here with us today. My name is Dr. Walid Boone. I am the director of the Transition Academy here at Mega Evers College. And some of the services that we provide to our students who are faced with homelessness, housing instability, and food insecurity is to make sure they stay on track, graduate on time, and improve their living conditions. We were started in 2017. We became aware that we have students on campus that are homeless. So students, deans, administrators, faculty came together and said, we have to do something about this problem. What we didn't know that there was other issues that was going on with our students. It wasn't just homelessness. It was food insecurity. Our students were sacrificing buying the Metro card instead of buying groceries, which you will learn as we get through the program. We pride ourselves on making sure our students succeed academic success, which is to graduate. Because they look at a higher education degree as a stepping stone to better their living conditions or improve their salary. But I'm tasked here today to introduce the leader of Food Bank for NYC. Food Bank has been a strong partner of us. We are an institution that don't get much funding. It ain't no secret. And I speak direct 
for those who know me. So our external partners help us to make sure our students have the necessary resources they need to continue their education. And you'll hear more about it in the program. So with that said, I'm gonna read a little bit about the CEO and president of Food Bank. Leslie Gordon is Food Bank New York City's president and chief executive officer. She assumed the post at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic and led one of the nation's largest food banks to double its annual output of food from, from 70 million pounds to nearly 150 pounds of food in less than 18 months. Amazing. For more than a decade, Leslie has led efforts to feed our neighbors in need and help lift them out of poverty in New York City and surrounding communities. Leslie is also the chair of board of directors of Feeding New York State and a member of board of directors of the Hunts Point Cooperative Market. Please help me welcome a strong leader in the fight to combat hunger, Leslie Gordon. All right, all right, all right. Let me hear you a little bit louder. Good morning, Megger Evers. Oh, come on, y'all can do a little better. Good morning, Megger Evers. All right, welcome to the College Food Security Summit. My name is Leslie Gordon. I have the daily, regular honor and pleasure of being the president and CEO of our food bank for New York City. First, I want to start out with two simple but really important words. Thank you. A great big heartfelt thank you to Medgar Evers College for hosting us today. Thank you, Dr. Boone, President Ramsey, and to all our amazing CUNY partners, students, pantry managers. A great big heartfelt thank you to our amazing and talented Food Bank for New York City team. Everyone is a person of promise, a burning, brilliant light of energy, poised to become personally amazing. We all, each and every one of us, and all of our students across this great city and in the CUNY system, have a right to self-determination and to achieve what we want for ourselves. I believe that as a community, we have a responsibility, it is an imperative, to help elevate and lift each other to be individually amazing in the ways that we envision for ourselves. Collectively, we are the helpers. We're all assembled here today to ensure that all who want to achieve their dreams have all the important and fundamental resources that they need to achieve their dreams. It takes all of us working together, leveraging our great strengths and assets to help others soar and see no limits. And at Food Bank, we're honored to be doing this important work with you. There are about 1.2, 1.3 million New Yorkers who are currently facing food insecurity. Have the stress not knowing when their next meal is going to be or what it will be. And many of them, very unfortunately, are students right here at Medgar Evers. Believe it or not, college students are more likely to struggle with hunger than the general population. If you're food insecure before you come to college, just because you set foot on a campus does not mean that that issue and that problem disappears. There's tuition. We all know non-tuition expenses. There's books. There's housing. There's technology purchases. You need a new laptop. All these can present real challenges for students. And that cannot and should not happen in our amazing city and our great nation. Not long ago, I met an incredible woman who runs a mobile pantry program at, at one of our agencies in Manhattan. She came here from another country to get her graduate degree and study homelessness in, in New York City. 
Ironically, she wound up homeless herself, living on the subway, but because she had a book bag and books in her hand, no one knew, and she told no one. Let it begin right here today that we make it okay for people who are food insecure to feel confident and comfortable in talking about their experiences and raising their hand to say, I need help or I'm here to help. Throughout today, you'll hear stories from some incredibly brave young people, and I can't wait to meet them, who said that their CUNY campus pantry quite literally saved their lives, and we thank them for their bravery. It is our great honor to partner with Medgar Evers and with all of you from colleges around our great city. What realities must we face when talking about uh, food insecurities, just in general? Yeah, but there's lots of reasons why people are food insecure, right? There's a whole continuum of issues that cause someone to find themselves not having enough food to eat. It could be housing issues, could be mental illness, could be underemployment, could be unemployment. It really just runs the gamut. Um, it's a very stressful condition, and it's, it's never who you think it is, right? I think there's a, a great sensibility that, oh, it must be someone who's homeless, right? Um, and I challenge people. It's an invisible problem. Often you don't know. It could be your neighbor. It could be your coworker. Um, it could be a fellow student right here at, at Medgar Evers. What message do you hope attendees take away from this summit? Um, people don't have to be food insecure. Right here in the United States, we have plenty of food to go around, right? It's not like we have a lack of food. And so it's going to take both the public and private sector coming together very intentionally and continuously to do good work, but also to give people the power and the authority and the freedom and the comfort level and confidence to talk about these issues. How can, uh, how can people donate their time or donate anything monetarily? Sure. So at Food Bank for New York City, we start early, right? Uh, kids can start volunteering with us at, you know, age six, age seven. Uh, you need Sorry, what, what do you have for them to do at that age? Um, so they learn about food insecurity, right? We generate awareness, we do education moments with them, and then they volunteer alongside parents or caregivers repacking food in our distribution center or at our community kitchen in West Harlem, among some other activities. It's important to start early. Hello, it's a real honor and privilege to be here, and thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I started my work on uh, food insecurity at CUNY which uh, in 2010 when the chancellor at the time asked uh, me and my colleagues to find out why so many CUNY students were coming to events where free food was being distributed. And he was hearing that more and more people were showing up and he wanted to know why. Well, we did a study, uh, a survey of a sample of CUNY students and found shockingly high rates of food insecurity, something that people at CUNY at that time didn't know. And this was probably a time when many of you were toddlers. So what I'm going to do today is talk a little about where things stand today around food insecurity. So uh, we, uh, through Healthy CUNY and working with the CUNY Office of Institutional Research, have been doing periodic surveys of representative samples of students. And uh, what I'm showing you here are the results from a survey in 2018, before the COVID pandemic, in 2020, at the start uh, of the pandemic, and then at the bottom, some results from our most recent survey uh, in fall 2022. And what they show is, as a result of the pandemic, there was a really staggering increase in food insecurity. The proportion of CUNY students who said, They'd gone hungry, often or sometimes in the last year, went up from 
13% to 18%. And look at that last bar, the proportion of students who said they worried about running out of food. That rate almost tripled. And I think uh, we need to grasp the devastating effect the pandemic and the economic consequences have had on the lives of our students. And we're only beginning to address uh, that devastation. What the numbers at the bottom show is since the height of the pandemic, uh, the rates of food insecurity have gone down a little bit. I'll show you some uh, other recent numbers, uh, but they're still way above what it was before the pandemic. And in this survey that we did in 2010, we were staggered by the high rates then, which were quite a bit lower than those previous rates. And this uh, is a consequence of a city that has allowed poverty to increase, that has allowed income inequality to increase. So I want to be sure that we understand the problem of food insecurity at CUNY is located within the problem in New York City and the nation. So this is a survey that was done by the CUNY uh, Office of Institutional Research. It's called the Student Experience Survey. You can find it online. Uh, and it was a survey of, I think, about 9,000 students at almost all the CUNY campuses. And what that survey showed in, uh, was that at the community colleges, the level of food insecurity defined by a number of measures uh, used by the U.S. Department of Agriculture was 44%. At the four-year schools, 36%. And we need to note that difference and make sure that the CUNY efforts to address food insecurity uh, reach those most in need, which is people in community college, uh, students of color, low-income students, recent immigrants. Those are the groups at CUNY, women compared to men, uh, who are experiencing higher rates. And the overall rate was about 38%. But the other thing to say, uh, not shown as clearly is that every CUNY campus and every sector of our society, some people are experiencing food insecurity. At the Graduate Center that educates PhD students, there's students struggling with food insecurity. And that's true at the four-year schools, at my school, the School of Public Health, uh, and also at the, all the other campuses. So uh, in the work that I've been doing on food insecurity, over the last uh, decade and a half, I've been become convinced that the most meaningful solution for uh, reducing food insecurity is to enroll people who are eligible in SNAP uh, in that. And I want to make that case. Food pantries are wonderful. We should have food pantries. They help people get through the day, and they provide a level of support. But food pantries will never, at CUNY or elsewhere, will never address the problem of food insecurity comprehensively. They don't have enough resources. They don't have enough space. They don't have enough food. They don't have enough staff. And so we need to look for more meaningful distinctions. And I'm hoping I'll convince you that this enrolling people in SNAP ought to be our priority and using our food pantries uh, both on campus and in the community to find out who's eligible for SNAP, not everybody is, and to enroll them. And so what we found was, and the, uh, I'll tell you a little about the work we're currently doing, and my team is here. I'm very happy to see the CUNY CARES team here, uh, uh, that we're doing in the Bronx uh, to show what a different approach to meeting students' essential needs can look like. And we, have, uh, we did a survey in fall, 2022 of about 2,000 students enrolled at the three Bronx campuses, uh, Hustos, Lehman, and uh, Bronx Community College. Why the Bronx? We wished we had the resources to work at all 25 campuses, but we didn't. And we knew that both rates of poverty and ill health were highest in the Bronx, and we also had been working with folks there for a while. So we're starting there and hoping what we learn, we can share with you what you're learning at Medgar and other New York City Technical, other CUNY campuses, we can exchange. And together, uh, as uh, Walik just told me, when we're all together, that's when we win uh, political victories. So what we found is that overall, about 30% of the students at, in the Bronx were eligible for SNAP, and the numbers were a little different 
at the different campuses. And then if we look at the next slide, these figures to my mind uh, startle me every time I see them and I've now looked at them a lot over the last year or two. We estimate, and these are uh, best guess estimates. We think our estimates are better than anyone else's who's looked at this problem, but we uh, deciding who's eligible for SNAP, unfortunately, as many of you know, is a complicated process. So this is our best guess using the data we have on household finances and a few other things. 50% of Bronx students were eligible for SNAP last year. Of those eligible students, 60% were not enrolled in the program. An estimated 30% of the student population in the Bronx, about 7,200 of the approximately 30,000 students enrolled at the three Bronx campuses. And listen to this. This is our challenge that I hope you'll take out going forward. Only 3% of students with SNAP reported that CUNY assisted them to enroll. And I'm hoping in the next year we can see that go to 10%, 20%, 50%, 80%. If CUNY helped all those to enroll in SNAP, it would bring an additional $25 million, $25 million looking at the average benefit for a single household member into the households of Bronx CUNY students. If CUNY helped to enroll half of those eligible, it would bring an additional $12.6 million into students' households. And so what we're doing what this picture is showing, what CUNY is doing and uh, what New York City is doing is leaving money on the table, leaving money that could support our students. And we could make the same comparison around Medicaid, around WIC, and enrolling students in the benefits for which they're eligible is a surefire way. And it's supported by the mayor and the governor because the public benefits are federal dollars. They like bringing federal dollars into New York. It's supported by the business community because people having SNAP and WIC means they can go to their local store and buy food and support economic growth. So it's a win-win, but we haven't done it at CUNY. And if one uh, thing that excites me comes out of this meeting, it's that we'll determine to make that happen in the next year or two. Again, from this survey, fewer than half the students reported being aware that there was food assistance resources on their campus. So that's uh, low hanging fruit. That's an easy victory. We need to go out and educate students about where the resources are on the campus and in the community. And the primary reason students gave for not using campus resources was not believing they were eligible. This is excluding those uh, who said they didn't need it, lacking knowledge and resources about the availability and accessibility of SNAP and feeling, this is again makes me very sad, feeling that other people needed food assistance more. Even though they said they were hungry and running out of food, they thought, well, other people need it more. I don't want to take it away. So that is a mentality that we need to change. And uh, I think sometimes those of us doing work around food security emphasize too much stigma. Certainly stigma is a factor, but we, what we can do something about is removing the administrative barriers that our campuses, that CUNY, that HRA, that the USDA impose, removing those barriers to make it easy for anyone to enroll. That, in my mind, uh, needs to be put on a par with addressing stigma. And there's a uh, report uh, we did on some policy recommendations. The link is there. Uh, I'm certainly happy to make these slides available uh, in the website of, the, uh, of this conference, and some of you might want to look at that. But as all of you know, food insecurity doesn't stand alone. Students have a lot of problems. And again, through the survey we did in the Bronx in fall 2022, what we found is that more than half of CUNY students in the Bronx had two or more unmet needs. Uh, and uh, we defined four uh, needs for food security, for housing stability, a term we use to define 
Uh, anyone who has housing problems is housing unstable. It's a broader term than uh, homelessness, and many more CUNY students are housing unstable than actually homeless. And if we can help someone who's housing unstable to address that problem, we prevent the disaster that homelessness can uh, present. So 50% of CUNY students in the Bronx, and my guess is the numbers are not so different elsewhere, had two or more of these unmet needs. You know, you've probably all seen CUNY does a wonderful job of moving people into the middle class, moving people out of poverty, making uh, productive, uh, helping them to lead more productive lives, become civically engaged, all those wonderful things. But you may also know that only about 50% of the people who enroll in two-year and four-year schools actually graduate. So half the people who come to CUNY are losing the wonderful lifetime health, social, economic benefits that come from having a college degree, our degree, a CUNY degree. And what can we do together to ensure that that number goes from 50% to 60% to 80%. And one of the things we can do is help students meet their essential needs for housing, food security, healthcare, mental health. And I want to, uh, next slide please, just say some of the things, and for many of you this is uh, preaching to the converted. What are some of the things we can do in our campus food security programs. As I've said, we can help people enroll in SNAP and WIC, uh, and we can troubleshoot for people who are actually enrolling. Uh, we can ensure that our food pantries have the hours open, the space, the staffing, and the supply of good food that they need. And there's more work to be done there, as all of you who work in those programs know. We can also work to ensure that our cafeterias and our vending machines are uh, providing healthy, affordable food. Uh, separately from the work I'm talking to you about today, a group of us are working to convince CUNY to end its pouring rights contract with Pepsi. CUNY now has a 10-year contract that expires at the end of 2023 that gives Pepsi the exclusive right to stock beverages in all CUNY cafeterias and all CUNY vending machines. And, and, and Pepsi, over 10 years, uh, pays, I think, $20 million to CUNY for that right. But that money comes from the beverages that CUNY students are drinking that increase their risks for diabetes and heart disease. And that isn't right. A university shouldn't be making money by selling access to its students. So we're hoping some of you will join our campaign to convince the CUNY board to end this pouring rights contract and come up with a healthier way. And finally, nutrition and food education. And the last thing I want to talk about, oh, I'm sorry, next to last thing, uh, some of the barriers to SNAP enrollment. And again, I'm saying this is our to-do list for the next period, that we should be taking on these barriers. And some of them are policy barriers at the national level, you know, as the Congress <laughs> if it can ever meet, uh, considers uh, the food and farm bill, we need to look at uh, SNAP eligibility. And there are some groups advocating for improved eligibility for college students and easing some of those administrative barriers. And we also need to be working here in the city uh, to ensure that HRA and other city agencies are doing all they can to uh, make it easy to enroll in SNAP. So, so we're trying a new model of care in the Bronx that we hope to learn about, share, and get your feedback on. And the commitment we have from the chancellor is if we show in the Bronx over the next three years that we can improve uh, retention and graduation rates by addressing students' essential needs, this model will then go to all 25 campuses. We're gonna need your help in making that a reality. And what our program includes is students advising students, we hire students and pay them to be navigators and advocates to connect their peers to community and campus-based services. Uh, we are building capacity, helping to hire new staff at the campuses. We're very excited because we've just hired what we think is the first full-time person to work on housing issues at CUNY. Uh, to work on the three Bronx campuses, both to assist students 
facing housing instability to get help and also to develop partnerships with housing providers. We'd love to share what we're learning and we know here at Medgar Evers, you're doing a lot of great work in that area as well. We're establishing partnerships. We've had a ongoing dialogue with Health and Hospitals, another institution committed to equity in New York City to make it easier for CUNY students who either don't have health insurance or aren't satisfied with the, what they have to get the primary health care and mental health care and sexual and reproductive health care they need at H&H. &H. We're also working with Hunger Free America to bring their staff to our campuses and our students to their offices to help people enroll in SNAP, as well as with some local Bronx providers. We're trying to integrate academic uh, initiatives with student service initiatives. We're uh, helping prepare students who are working with us as advocates and navigators to get jobs when they graduate in the health and social services sector and giving them the skills and credentials they need. CUNY has 50,000 students studying health and human services. We, uh, in the work we're doing on our campuses, can be preparing those students to get good jobs. Uh, and, and that is our, our work around career success. And finally, we're doing a systematic evaluation. CUNY has invested a lot for a long time in student services. Many of you know about those services, but we've not done a very good job in evaluating the impact or tracking progress. And so we're hoping by doing a rigorous evaluation of CUNY CARES, we can see what works, what needs to be changed, and then we hope bring it to all campuses. And the last slide, I'd love to hear from some of you uh, beyond this meeting. Uh, I hope you'll look at some of our resources. And thank you so much. And I look forward to continuing to work with all of you. Thanks. What social policies are affecting our food environment? Well, our food environment, I think, is influenced by uh, many different factors. You know, uh, a, a fundamental influence is do families have the income and the resources they need to afford food? That's on the one hand. And are the producers of food, the food industry, the agricultural industry, producing healthy, affordable food at a price that most people can afford? And we have problems on both those sides. People aren't earning enough to afford healthy food, as well as housing, as well as medical care, as well as education. And our food system, you know, controlled by a, a, a market economy has as its priority making profits rather than supporting health. So those are two really deep uh, causes of both food insecurity, which is one side of the problem that more than a million people in New York don't have enough food, uh, but also uh, a, a variety of health problems related to diet diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, obesity. And so we have a food system that's creating food insecurity and food insecurity rather than health. That's a big problem. Um, what happens when families have to make a choice between uh, rent and food? Well, that's a really uh, tough choice for anybody to have to make. And it's a tough choice for CUNY students to have to make. A lot of our students have to make those choices. And the research we've done shows that somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of CUNY students are food insecure. In other words, they worry about are they going to get enough food with the income they have. And I think because housing is such a basic need and because New York has done such a lousy job of creating enough affordable housing, many people go for rent first and eat less. Because if you have to choose between a full stomach and a roof over your head, many people understandably choose the roof over their head. Right, right. And you would think that with all the buildings that's going up now, any of them would be affordable housing or any kind of contribute, you know, to, to what's going on, but it's not. Not necessarily, no, because the developers and uh, real estate speculators make more money on high income housing. So that's what we've seen going up more of that than the low income housing that's needed. What realities must, um, must we face when speaking about food insecurity? Well, I think we need to understand that it's uh, deeply rooted in characteristics of our society, some of the things that we already talked about. I think the most 
fundamental cause of food insecurity is poverty and income inequality. And here in New York and in the United States, we've become more unequal. There are more, the gap between the wealthiest and the poor has been getting wider. And I think uh, that's a problem we need to address. And that's a complicated, deep problem. We've been struggling with that as a country for a long time, but the real solutions to that are what is needed. I think there's some other short-term solutions. Uh, there are a bunch of public programs that make healthy food more affordable. There's a school food program. There's SNAP, what used to be called food stamps. There's WIC for young mothers and pregnant women and their young children. And we and CUNY need to do a much better job of ensuring that people who are eligible for those programs actually get enrolled. And I, the work I've been doing through Healthy CUNY has been looking to find every CUNY student who's eligible for SNAP and helping them to get enrolled. I think that is a very promising strategy here at CUNY, and it's also something that will support the families of our students, uh, because if they have SNAP, that benefits their household members as well. That's, a, that's a, a great thing, because a lot of students don't even realize that they qualify for SNAP. That's right. That's right. And they don't know where they can go for help. Uh, so we're trying to do both the education that you talked about, but also the actually helping people to get to the city agency, HRA, and others to enroll in SNAP. So we're going to highlight a video here, as I alluded to earlier, that the Transitional Academy just don't come back hunger here. We also come back in homelessness, housing instability. And there are students here that come forward for their bravery to share their story so they can get other students from behind the shadows. And we're going to show a video here and then we're going to dive more into the information. I'm a junior at Mega Evers College with a major in psychology. Juggling school with two children and being homeless was a traumatizing time. Once you have nowhere to live, you have no plan. Having limited food because I have nowhere to live, even if I had money for food, there was nowhere to store the food. I felt really overwhelmed having to deal with so many things at one time. Yes, I felt hurt. Yes, I felt pain. Good morning, Transition Academy. This is Margaret speaking. How can we help you? But with the help of the Transition Academy, I was able to know that I had people on my side that would advocate for me. They honestly helped to save my life. I wouldn't be where I am today without the help of them. And I feel really honored to know that there's people that care. It's not just a job here. Welcome. It's people that's going to work hard, sun up to sun down, to make sure that you meet the needs to be successful in school. And it may be just giving out food to others, but for myself who had nothing, this is all I could turn to when I needed anything. I just want to say to them, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your compassionate hearts. Thank you for going above and beyond. And what you do is very important to students like myself. These is real stories behind the numbers. Sometimes we can look at numbers, but not understand the story. This is the reason why we do the work that we do here at Mega Abbas College. We want our students to be successful. And there's many more out there, just like Ms. Pittman, that comes to us for the services. They no longer have to hide in the shadows. They can come to the Transitional Academy. They can get the resources that they need. And they know we're going to go to bat for them to make sure they achieve academic success. So I also have the honor to introduce another partner. I mentioned earlier that Meg Evers College is one of the institutions that don't receive a lot of funding. So we, are, we rely on our external partners. So I'm going to introduce Mr. Uh, Robert Yancey, who I met in 2000, via phone 2017, when we pretty much, when the Transition Academy came into existence. No resources, making phone calls, just trying to make connections. I called Neighborhood Coalition for Shelter, got Mr. Yancey let him know what we were starting here, this population we was targeting. He said, I might have something for you. Three years went by because I'm doing the work, he's doing the work. 
That fourth year, I get reconnected with Mr. Yancey. He said, Waleek, I want you to come aboard with a, with a program we're trying to start. And just give us some ideas of the work that mm -hmm. you're doing at Transitional Academy because you have a stable program there that I think your students can benefit from what we want to put together here. So what was created was the Neighborhood Coalition for Scholars, not Shelters, which is a program that's have housing mega college students and other CUNY students to make sure they have some form of stability so they can focus more on the academics versus focusing on where they're gonna get something to eat or where they're gonna lay their head. Very important. So I'm gonna introduce Mr. Yancey. Robert Yancey was appointed Chief Program Officer at Neighborhood Coalition for Shelter in 2016, previously serving as a Program Director at Neighborhood Coalition Shelter Lewis Nine Housings. Robert is a mentor for the Supportive Housing Network of New York's uh, Ready Emerging Leadership in Supportive Housing, which is called Relish Mentorship Program. Let's give a round of applause for Mr. Yancey. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me, uh, Dr. Boone. Um, Dr. Boone talked about uh, how we connected at first. Um, the position I have at the Neighborhood Coalition for Shelter is the Chief Program Officer and oversee all the programs there. Um, so we provide housing for uh, single adults, uh, young adults that were formerly homeless and coming out the, the shelter systems, uh, foster care systems, um, uh, mental health programs and um, inpatient mental health programs and substance abuse programs. Um, so he gave me a call and he said he was looking to house one of the students. Um, and I said, we'll leak right now, I don't have anything and I, and I will try to help you and get you uh, connected with something because we, we do things through referrals to the city system. Um, um, uh, a little bit about our agency, we've been around about 40 years doing uh, work in, in shelters and homelessness, connecting um, New Yorkers that, that were either transitioning from shelters or, or homelessness in, into supportive housing and stable housing environments. Um, so the face 40 years ago of homelessness were single men, single men. Um, and fast forward to today, that, that face has changed. Um, it's, it's single people, um, young people, uh, families, people of color, people with mental health disorders, um, people with so many disabilities. Um, so our agency was out there on the forefront. Um, so we had heard about the crisis of homelessness uh, amongst young people in public schools um, during the pandemic, right before, the, when the pandemic started. Um, so we said we needed to do something. Um, we reached out to uh, people that had done some research, like the Hope Center, who had some statistics on, on homelessness um, of people that were attending school, basically. Um, uh, we knew that we didn't have a lot of experience dealing with young people, um, older adults and young adults, we did have some experience. So we decided to uh, target the college student population. Um, so some of the stats that um, the Hope Center has, um, and this was a study that was done in 2020, um, and about 48% of the students in have experienced housing insecurity. 14% have been uh, affected by homelessness, and that's over a 12-month period. Um, and if you, you, you look down, if you go a little deeper, in the city, in the city system, there's about 14% of people that have experienced homelessness. 55% have housing insecurity uh, over the previous year. And the number of students that CUNY has in the system is about 240,000. So if you take that number at those percentages, it's about 34,000 people that have experienced homelessness or either homeless while attending school. 
Um, so we, we said that we needed to kind of really do something uh, about this, this issue. Um, we went to uh, CUNY at large. We went to the city um, to see how we could partner. Um, we kind of got turned away because they thought we wanted money. Uh, to kind of partner with them. Uh, the one thing about our agency, we, we're good uh, about raising money and, and tackling problems. So what we came up with was a, a pilot program to house homeless college students or students that were at risk of, of homelessness. Um, so the perfect person to connect with was with Dr. Boone. Um, he had this program here at Megas, Evans, uh, college that um, had identified people that were housing insecure, um, that, has, that had things going on in their life. Um, because we needed to kind of verify people with homelessness, that were homeless and not bring people into the program that just wanted a better place to stay. Um, and, and Dr. Boone does great work. You know, he's, he's working endlessly with the individuals that, that attend here at, at Mega Resus College. So what we were able to do was be able to raise um, funding to uh, lease 23 units in a, a building in Queens. Um, so in that building, it's a co-habiting uh, co space where people that live there share the apartments with individuals they don't know. So it was really perfect for what we wanted to do because we didn't want the, the college students to be identified as homeless, right? So in this building, we have units that with two, three bedroom apartments that the, the students share um, and they're not identified as, as homeless college students. Um, it's in um, Queens, um, right over the bridge. Uh, a really nice new development, has a lot of amenities. Um, they share apartments, they share uh, common space, um, they have their own bedroom, um, there's washer dryers, um, just a lot of things in that, in that area that they can take advantage of. Right now, we do not charge a fee to the students. Um, we are trying to remove barriers uh, for them to get to where they need to be, and that's academic success. Um, we do have some, some academic requirements that kind of mirror what CUNY is set forward. Um, and we know with some people that um, going through school is not linear. You know, there's a lot of peaks and valleys there, right? So um, our program director has a lot of flexibility about, um, about applying policy and things that, that um, apply to the, the students in our program. Um, so we have been fortunate to, to connect um, again with, with Dr. Boone and Transitions, and, and we house about maybe about 15 students right now from Mega River College. Um, we, we, we are housing presently only students from CUNY. Um, we have some, some residents that are from LaGuardia and uh, Bronx community. Um, what we found is that um, we've run a, a young adult supportive housing program. Um, and it's 46 young individuals that have their own apartments, um, they have leases and things like that, but there's a lot of things that go on in that building. Um, so we were prepared to kind of face those same kind of challenges. Um, and we were surprised that um, on the orientation, that the date of orientation, um, we orientated about 10, 10 uh, students. Um, so they came. Um, did orientation, then we gave them a view of the, of the units. And you should have saw how their eyes lit up. Um, and then we took them back down and we let them sign for their keys. Um, and they wanted to move in that day. Um, so, you know, it, it was a good feeling to, to be able to assist and support young people that had been committed and dedicated to their education and, and moving forward in their life with the challenge of, of not having a place, a stable, adequate environment to, to live and to study in. Um, so we, we are looking forward to, to increase those numbers. Um, we have maybe about three more units in that building. We're gonna be looking forward for new spaces to kind of um, develop. Um, 
we have been receiving a lot of inquiries about people that want to help, um, anonymous donors, um, because this issue is something that people don't really know, that people that are going to college don't have a place to stay. Um, I know we talk a lot about food insecurity, um, but housing insecurity is, is a real problem here in the city. Um, so with that, I thank you. There's always been a level of housing insecurities. Um, what do you think more people, what do you think we can do to have people pay more attention to it? I think that we can highlight the fact that uh, housing, there's a housing shortage here in the city and, and throughout the nation. Um, the availability of affordable housing is something that we really, really need to, to, to look at and address. What are some of the realities that we have to face um, when we speak about housing insecurities? I think that some of the realities are is that the, that the face of homelessness used to be single adults. But now we're seeing uh, young adults, family um, with children are now the face of homelessness. Yeah, yes, yes. And with rent becoming ridiculous now mm -hmm. and... Um, out of the out, out of reach to many, what can be done to or what can we start to do to protect that? Um, I think we should um, protect the the affordable housing market that we have um, in here in the city, the rent control, um, just to um, replenish that stock and and create more. And some um, misconceptions mm -hmm. about the the housing insecurity. I think that people, they think people just lose housing, that they just walk away, that they, they don't want to pay rent. But rent is, is, is a, a challenge for a lot of people nowadays. Or that it, it, it can't happen to them. It, exactly, exactly. Now, with the summit, um, what do you hope uh, people attendees would take away from today? I think the, the awareness that uh, housing insecurity and food uh, insecurity is a real issue today, uh, more than ever. Um, um, wages are stagnated um, and things just keep going up and people have to make a choice between eating and living sometimes just um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's something that we're trying to get through today, right? Okay. That's it. And ladies and gentlemen, Robert Yancey, thank you very much. Right, thank you so much. factors impact food insecurity on college campuses. Take your pick. Low wages, unemployment, homelessness, student loan debt. About 40% of college students face food insecurity nationwide. Student hunger should not be part of the college experience. Please join the Transition Academy at Medgar Evers College to help combat student hunger. For more information, please call 718-270-6988. That's 718-270-6988 or scan the QR code for more details.